ladies and gentlemen, this morning we are extremely privileged to have with us Professor Sir Sabharatna Marul Kumaran, uh, Arul to us. You may remember he was three years senior to us and graduated in 1972 uh, from, from our old alma mater, uh, the Colombo Medical Faculty. Now, Arul worked in Sri Lanka for a few years and then he went to the UK. But while working in Sri Lanka, he also uh, got his DCH. And then he went to the UK where he obtained both his FRCS and MRCOG. Uh, and from then onwards, uh, he, he went on to uh, the University of Singapore, National University of Singapore, as a lecturer in obstetrics and gynecology. And while there, obtained a, a PhD. Now, Arul, what was the PhD uh, about? Uh, it was on uterine activity in labor. That's right, yeah. And then he, he went up the ladder in, in the National University of Singapore, became a senior lecturer, and then the professor and head of department of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. In 1997, he was headhunted by the University of Nottingham to be their foundation professor of obstetrics and gynecology and the head of the department in that new medical school. He was there for about four years and then again he was headhunted by the St. George's Medical School where he became a professor of obstetrics and gynecology and head of department where he was till he retired a few years ago. He now is Professor Emeritus of the St. George's Medical School. Now, as if that were not enough, he was also president of the Royal College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists for three years. He then became president of the British Medical Association and then president of the Federation of International Gynecologists and Obstetricians. And finally, to cap it all, he, was, uh, he became a knight of the realm conferred upon him by the Queen uh, of England. His research activity is amazing. He has hundreds of original uh, peer-reviewed research papers, many, many book chapters and many books to his credit. And even to this day, he continues as the editor of the best practice in obstetrics and gynecology. And many countries have honored him with uh, DSCs and their own uh, honors, national honors. And Sri Lanka is one of them, where he was uh, awarded the, the honor of Sri Lanka Ranjana a few years ago. Now that's a, a, a resume of Arul's achievements in, in the last uh, several decades. Now I want to start off this interview, Arul, by asking you, when you were growing up in Jaffna many years ago, did you for a moment think that you will end up as professor and head of the department of three leading medical schools, one in Singapore and two in the United Kingdom? president of the Royal College of Obstetricians and a knight of the realm. Did you for a moment imagine that this is where you were headed? Not at all, Kuhir. I never thought that I would be able to achieve all that because when I was growing in Jaffna, the whole aim was to get a job in the government service. That was when I was young till I went up to the JSC or the junior school certificate. At the old level, I was thinking I should be a, become a railway guard or a pilot. I was attracted by uniform jobs. And then also I applied to become a sub-inspector of police because a lot of my friends became sub-inspectors of police. And once I got the old level and the enough credits and went to A-level, then I thought I should do medicine and then went into medicine and became a doctor. But at that stage, I never thought that I'm going to do uh, academic medicine. I entered the Colombo Medical School. I was um, attracted by the professors and demonstrators. I wanted to first become a demonstrator in anatomy or physiology. Then I wanted to went to clinical medicine. Then I wanted to be a consultant. Then when I post beca became a postgraduate and started following postgraduate lectures, then I wanted to be a professor. <laughs> so, so, uh, 
the ambitions uh, started growing little by little. So I, in Jaffna, I would I never thought that I would be able to achieve all this. Uh, that, that, that's very, very, very nice of you to say all that, Arul. So it was a gradual process, obviously. Yeah. But what was, what, when did you actually think that there was this potential within you to achieve all of this? Mm -hmm. Was that a turning point at, at some, some point or was it a gradual process? It was a gradual process. And um, I, as, as you said, I, I did my MRCOG and FRCS and went back to Sri Lanka in 1982. I had this sort of burning desire that I want to be on the academic side, clinical academics. So I approached uh, the four universities then, Colombo, Candy, Gore, and Jaffna. Unfortunately, there were no vacancies because uh, the uh, Sri Lankan medical schools have only limited number of vacancies for academic staff. So I went there in January 1982 and uh, I started looking at the British Medical Journal for the classified advertisements applied to Papua New Guinea, Nigeria, Singapore, and got Singapore. And I went there and um, started a lecture as a lecturer and then senior lecturer and then up to professor and head. So I think it's a gradual desire, but the desire to do academic medicine was when I came to the UK to do postgraduate medicine. And, and, and then Arul, um, uh, as you, as you know, Arul, uh, as our, our viewers know, Arul has achieved some things that, that the majority, the vast majority of us can only dream about. And I think the, the highest award that, that you have had, uh, I like to get your views about that, was, was when you were conferred the knighthood by her, by her Majesty the Queen. What did you feel? What, what, what were your thoughts when you were told that you were going to become a knight of the realm? Well, I, I came back from a visit, some academic visit, and I saw this letter from the Prime Minister. At that time, it was Gordon Brown saying that uh, the committee and the cabinet has uh, decided to award the Knight Bachelor and whether I would be happy to accept it. And who is not going to say <laughs> No, I said yes. And it comes about a month before the actual uh, name is gazetted. So I replied, but it was first a disbelief so I read a few times, is it Knight Bachelor? Maybe some other honor <laughs> might be a OBE or MBE, but then it was Knight Bachelor. So first it was disbelief, then it was a feeling of happiness because I thought people have recognized uh, how much I contributed to medicine and healthcare. So I was uh, delighted and my family was delighted. And I was also delighted for another reason because we used to look up to Sir Nicholas Artigala when we were students. He was the vice chancellor of the University of Ceylon. And uh, I thought after him, I was the next medical person to get uh, knighted. So I was very happy that I had done proud for Sri Lanka as well. And, and, and uh, anybody reading your CV or even an abbreviated CV will know that this was a richly deserved honor. And, and, and your knighthood was awarded for, to you for services to a medicine, if I remember right. That's right, yes. And, and, and who better to get it? Now, uh, amongst all your achievements, Arul, do you have a special one? Is there something special? Um, when I think back, actually, you know, if I compare myself with uh, similar clinical academics, two things stand out for me. One is actually... In 2003, um, there was a major problem at Northwick Park Hospital in London. There were 10 maternal deaths in three years, which was about five to 10 times higher than the national average. So the minister at that time asked me to go and resolve the issue. And so I went there and uh, for the next 18 months, we didn't have a single death. I had three Sri Lankan colleagues who are consultants who helped me. Uh, Hemantha Senaka was there, Rudra and Samaragi. And in addition, I employed a number of uh, consultants. So the way I was able to change the clinical governance and safety of the department, that uh, is something which was acknowledged by the Department of Health. The second thing which I always uh, remember was a difficult one was I was appointed as chair of the Halapanava inquiry in Ireland. She died of uh, sepsis and septic shock following a late miscarriage. And uh, the law was not very clear, so I, I made it uh, 
a point that they should change the law. So the Irish Family Planning Association was asking me to come again and again. We went and talked to the parliamentarians, then had a parliamentary select committee. They agreed for a referendum in parliament and then the referendum, the abortion laws were passed. So I was very happy that I was able to initiate, not initiate, there were already people trying to reverse what we call as Amendment 8, uh, but I was instrumental in trying to push it uh, with the others. Of course, can't do it alone with the others to change and change the law. And, and, and for those of uh, our members who, who don't work in the UK, at the time that these things happened, these were very high profile incidents. Uh, and Arul, to his credit, uh, solved both of them. Now, this is a long journey, Arul, and it's an important journey. Who were your main inspirations during this journey? That's a good question. Name many, I can't say one. Uh, in clinical medicine, of course, Professor Priyani says I was house officer. She was keen for me to do pediatrics. So I did DCH. Um, then Dr. Ganesan, I worked with him in Castle Street. He was a great boss to work. And then when he became an SHO, I was at Ashley Dosnack. He was a fantastic boss. He, was, uh, he taught me all the surgery, gave me enough freedom. Um, uh, he took the responsibility if something went wrong. So I learned a lot, not only of uh, how to operate, but also how to behave and so forth. Then when I went to Singapore, Professor Ratnam, he introduced me to how to work in professional organizations like the National Bibajivan Society, the FIGO, and so forth. And in the UK, of course, Malcolm Simons, who has always come in contact with me, or the Dean of the Nottingham School who recruited me uh, to become professor to Derby, um, and also non-executive director to trust. So it was a heavy responsibility. So they trusted me, and Lord Patel was another one who was past president of the college. So throughout my life, there were many mentors, and I learned a lot from each one of them, and I'm most grateful to them all. Right, now, uh, th th that's very clear, and thank you for that. Now, the, the other question that, that some of my colleagues wanted me to ask you was, whether you, had, you would have left Sri Lanka when you did to go to Singapore, had the domestic situation been a little more peaceful? Uh, well, I think, uh, as I mentioned, uh, in 1982, January, there were not much of a problem. I think the problem started in 1983 somewhere. So when I left in 1982, it's purely my sort of uh, ego or a search to be an academic obstetrician and gynecologist. And I felt that I'm at DCH, FRCS, MRCOG. I did some special training in the UK. Um, in Cardiff um, with Miss Jones uh, colposcopy and Joe Jordan colposcopy. And so I, I wanted to be an academic. So I left in 1982, March. So it was before the times. And uh, if I would have got the job as an academic clinician in uh, Sri Lanka in 1982, I might have stayed on. So it's, um, it's my luck, I would think, you know, <laughs> to be at the right place at the right time and meet the right people. Right. Now, um, the other question that obviously crops up is, why did you choose obstetrics as a specialty? There were many others to choose from. And as you said, you had an interest in pediatrics and you did the DCH. But why did you uh, finally choose obstetrics as your specialty? That's an interesting question. I, I liked both subjects, uh, obstetrics and pediatrics, when I was a medical student. And I used to go and hang around. In fact, I used to hang around surgery as well. And uh, over the weekend, as a medical student, I go there and as is Jerry Jayasekara during the, you do all the casualty list and so forth. So I wanted to do a little bit surgery, but um, pediatrics was an attraction. But when I worked with Professor Priyani Sois, I had to do lumbar punctures and put IV cannulas and so on. And, and the children used to cry and I, <laughs> Emotionally, I couldn't just bear it some or other. So I took to obstetrics because I was a coward. I couldn't really, <laughs> the emotional upfront was uh, too <laughs> difficult. And, and also I liked doing a little bit surgery, so obstetrics and gynecology fitted me well. Okay. 
Uh, do, do you think that, that the two should be two separate specialties, obstetrics and gynecology? Because um, each specialty seems to have got a life of its own and they're super specialized. So do you think they should be broken up into two specialties? This uh, problem crops up uh, all the time at the college. And I think there are two things determines that. One is actually the workload for a consultant and also the number of consultants who are available. So for example, in Cardiff, where you are, and maybe in, in London, the teaching hospital, we have enough consultants and enough workload. In addition, there is subspecialization. So we can split that into some doing only obstetrics, some doing gynecology. But if we go into a smaller unit, uh, maybe uh, uh, Lincoln or <clears throat> some other few other smaller units, then if you have two people doing obstetrics and gynecology, uh, then they won't have enough workload. And especially night on call, you, you need more number of consultants to cover obstetrics separately and gynecology separately. So I think um, the speciality has evolved its way um, in such a way that because the, there are common understanding about female genital tract, the hormonal changes, the menstruation. So it's a, um, in, in some way actually it's a life cycle from adolescent health to reproductive health to menopause and so on. Uh, so in Sri Lanka, I, I visit Sri Lanka quite often and there is the same except for Disoisa or Castle Street the other hospitals are, the numbers are very small to have uh, separate obstetrics and separate gynecology. Even in Disoisa and Castle Street, they do to, um, they cover both obstetrics and gynecology because the number of consultants are not enough for the workload. But, but, but do you think if, if, if the, the numbers were adequate, they could form two specialties? Or yes. They form two specialties? Yeah. Uh, absolutely. If the numbers were adequate, like in Cardiff or St. George's or big uh, institution, then some can do only obstetrics and some can do only gynecology. Okay. Now, I think you're the best person to ask this from our role. You've done so much of research in your, in your life, taken part in randomized control trials and, and other forms of research. Um, what is the place of research in, in medicine as, as a whole? Obstetrics, gynecology, endocrinology, whatever subject. What is the place of research? Uh, in medicine in, 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 in uh, times when funding is, is limited? Well, I think we have to remember uh, research today is clinical practice tomorrow. So unless there is research and advancement of research, there is no, the clinical practice will not improve. The fact that uh, people are having a long life, those days they used to lie, die at 40, 50, 60, now they are living 70, 80, 90. Uh, the longevity and also they are living healthy, although they are conditions like hypertension, diabetes, it's all well controlled. And that is all due to research. And mainly the transition has been due to vaccines, antibiotics, then later antihypertensives and so on uh, came into picture. So whether the research is small or large, uh, and especially you mentioned about limited resources, I think as long as they do productive research, which can be translated from the bench to the bedside, that is quite useful. And one way of assessing this is actually the significance of the research, what we call as innovation, is the significance of the finding and the reach. Uh, let me give you two examples. One from Cardiff, uh, because I was in the research assessment exercise for the universities, and there's a group in Cardiff who found out that even in juvenile diabetic uh, patients, if they have a certain genetic composition, they can be treated with metformin. They don't have to take insulin. So that's a major advantage because for younger children, but that applies only to a small group of children. So that is the significance is high, but the reach is limited because of um, the limited number of people with juvenile diabetes with that particular genetic composition. But if you look at another research done in Australia by Barry Marshall, who was a gastroenterologist, and uh, uh, he used to do biopsies of peptic ulcers. And the pathologist used to say, there are some organisms, funny organisms in the biopsy. And Barry Marshall used to say, don't be silly. I learned the stomach is so acidic, you can't have any organism there. He said, you come and see. And he went and saw there were organisms. 
they decided to culture, they cultured, cultured, didn't get anything. And once they went on a boat trip, similar to their penicillin plumbing story, or they went on a boat trip, when they came back, they were organisms which are grown, overgrown, and they found the helicobacter. And he swallowed, he endoscoped himself, clean stomachs, swallowed and showed ulcers, then treated with antibiotics and cured. So when we were students and doctors, we used to have Bilroth 1, Bilroth 2, selective agotomy, gastro, <laughs> and all sorts of major operations. And overnight, the whole treatment turned. So the significance was high, and also the reach was high because it is reaching the whole world. So research in many forms are important. Uh, of course, it's difficult to judge which is going to give the best yield. And nowadays we are able to, or we are looking forward to the COVID vaccine. And that is also research. They have learned how to identify the antigens and how to generate the vaccine. So I think research is paramount. Although there are some research which is not going to give uh, much significance, but still they are important to encourage so that they can learn research methodology. Maru, you, you enunciate a very important principle there, which I've not heard uh, mentioned like you just done now, and that's that the, the significance and the reach of your research have both got to be high. And that's something that, that people forget when they, when they start doing uh, projects. Now, having said that, uh, how do we encourage our colleagues in Sri Lanka, for instance, where resources are poor, it's a resource poor setting, how do we encourage uh, maybe ourselves or our teams or our colleagues to help out in, in, in uh, making progress with research in research uh, resource poor settings like Sri Lanka? Well, I have interacted with them. They, <clears throat> they have mm -hmm. funding problem first. Second is resource personnel, because um, most of the time they're going in the morning operating or seeing patients till two o'clock. And into that comes into the, the eating the time is a private practice and the social issues as well in Sri Lanka. You have to go to somebody's wedding, somebody's something. So there are a number of factors which interplay. So we had to really uh, get hold of the colleges there to see whether they can use a common platform like the NIHR is doing in the UK so that all the hospitals contribute patient numbers to the same research. So they had to identify a similar infrastructure by the government of Sri Lanka to put an NIHR situation so that all the hospitals can contribute for clinical trials. Now, recently I had a paper published uh, from Jaffna, I was part of the, or from the Jaffna University. This is to look at the level of tranexamic acid in postpartum women after oral administration, because this follows the studies from London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Earlier they did the CRASH-2 study, then the woman study, tranexamic acid for PPH, which I was the chair of the steering committee. So I stimulated them. This is on IV, why don't you see the oral preparation? Because that'll be applicable to the whole world. So they got it done of, uh, 10 or 12 postpartum women, just smaller numbers, but they had the laboratory facilities to measure the tranexamic acid level in the blood. So that was published in the Green Journal. Now that will pro proceed to clinical trials. Um, so I think there are two types of trials where, as you said, if the resources are enough to do laboratory medicine, they must identify areas where they can do research in that area. But if it is not enough, then you can focus on clinical research, but without jealousy or competition, they must get together. And even if 10 hospitals contribute, they can get the numbers because they got enough numbers to do clinical research. But so then, think, yeah. Sorry. No, I think from top, somebody has to guide them. Yeah, but, but you think the, the, the establishment of a NIHR-like body is important there? I think so, because there, there are all our government hospitals and like the NHS, so they can, if they have a good research idea and they have a portfolio research saying this is the research and this is, but they have to give some inducement, like having a research midwife or a research doctor or somebody. 
there are enough young doctors who are willing to do that job and they are waiting for a job for six months, one year, two years to get a house officer job so they can be employed beneficially. Yeah, yeah. well, that, that's, that's very interesting. Now, the, the, the other issue, Arul, that, that worries some of us is that some of us in, in the older age bracket is that the art of doing medicine, the touchy feely things like taking a history, feeling somebody's tummy, listening to the heart, examining the chest and percussing and all that, is that being lost because of the advent of technology? Now, cardiologists uh, almost never listen to the heart. They get their echocardiogram out and that's it. They, they got, their, they got their, their diagnosis. But do you think the art of medicine is being lost to uh, the, the science or, or the technology part of it? That, that's a real worry, actually. You have sort of put the nail on the head. So um, I think it is partly our responsibility as senior clinicians, academicians, to emphasize the importance of history taking examination and so on. Because as you say, when the medical students present cases to me, they give the history and the next thing they jump is ultrasound <laughs> findings. They don't say what they, what they palpated in the abdomen. So we have to emphasize because the art of medicine is the one which attracts the patients more. The commitment of the physician, the compassion which you express by talking, touching, feeling, the companionship of the team so you can say please do this test or do this and so on and communication not only with the patient but with the relatives and so on and so forth so the art of commitment compassion communication confidence all this will come and that really plays a major role compared to well not compared to technology with technology because technology like ultrasound has advanced um, our field in obstetrics, of prenatal diagnosis, and also ultrasound has helped in many other disciplines. Uh, now they are doing non-invasive prenatal diagnosis uh, in maternal blood. So the technology is quite important. But as you say, the art is the one which really catches the eye of the patient and builds the trust, the respect and the trust from the patient. So you cannot be a good doctor unless you build respect and trust. And these two components come with art of medicine, not with technology. Uh, that, that's, that's very important, uh, Arul. Uh, now, just extending that a little bit, you're a surgeon after all, and that's, that's what your basic uh, life is about. You're, you're, you're a surgeon. But do you think that the, the advent of robotic surgery, where you sit in, a, in an office and manipulate the, the robot, do you think that's, that's detracting from your skills? Or is that the f future? Well, I don't do any robotic surgery, <laughs> but I know my colleagues do. I think um, the fundamental issue is that uh, whether an individual is a robotic surgeon or not, they should know the anatomy, physiology, pharmacology, pathology, everything clearly before they even start doing robotic surgery. The second issue is actually they should be good in conventional surgery because if robotic surgery, they can't achieve what they want to, or dissect or something, or there's bleeding or unexpected complication, they have to do an open laparotomy. So robotic surgery has advantages for the surgeon as well as the patient, there's no doubt about it. But it is not going to replace uh, what, the, the, what you expect out of a surgeon to learn the anatomy, physiology, pathology, pharmacology, and also know conventional surgery. Not all the uh, surgeons do robotic surgery because uh, it takes time. And um, of course, it's beneficial for the patient in terms of quick, um, small incisions, quick recovery and going home early. But uh, I, I don't think it's going to replace the entire conventional surgery. It is replacing quite a lot, but it's not total. Thank you. That, that's, that's interesting. Arul, this has been a fascinating interview so far. We've got a couple more questions to go, and one of them is, is, is about your shortcomings. Do you have any? And if so, what is your worst shortcoming? Well, the worst shortcoming is uh, my uh, 
inability to say no to friends when they ask me to come and give lectures and write articles and chapters. You feel a bit morally obliged, oh, so-and-so is asking, so I must do this and so on. As a result, what happens is that I have little time to spend with my good friends for a drink or a barbecue or with my relatives uh, for things. So uh, some of my relatives and friends might think this fellow is big headed, he's unable to come to our party or something, but the reality is actually you have deadlines to finish. If I had to give a lecture, I had to prepare and get it organized, if I had to prepare. So, I think it's a mix up of, um, so that's the shortcoming on my part that is actually in the inability to say no for certain requests. And it's partly also due to the positions you take. You know, I was head of the department in Singapore, Nottingham and, and, and St. George's. So I have to encourage my junior doctors, lecturers, senior lecturers to write papers, to give lectures and so on and so forth. So unless I accept an invitation, to write or edit a book or something. I can't give opportunities to the youngsters. And one of my responsibilities as head of department is to push them up. Um, so it's actually, uh, what do you call it? It's a double-ended sword sort of thing. You know, <laughs> you want to do it and you don't want to do it, but at the same time, it becomes a necessity. Right. So that's, that's a major shortcoming, but I don't regret uh, that. Uh, I, I regret sometimes, but not all the time. Yeah. <laughs> But we are happy that, that you said yes to this interview, despite your busy schedule. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, Arul, there, there, there are a couple more questions to go. Uh, one, of, one of the questions you just touched upon, and that's how you find time to uh, have a, a happy, successful family life, uh, which I know about, and you're busy, academic, and clinical schedule. How do you find time to have a a good family life? I think the key is your wife and the family, the children who should be understanding. So my wife uh, is daughter of Dr. Mutatambi, who was obstetrician in Colombo. So she knew that the father was working day and night, although he was in Castle Street and then in private sector. So she understands that for my commitment, I had to work and I stay till 12 midnight, get up at five o'clock. And, you know, so she knows that I'm not uh, loitering around, I'm doing some work. So she takes the responsibility to look after the children, uh, to all the, do the shopping, looking after the bills. And so I don't have to focus my mind on number of activities. I am. So to be honest, I've been focusing my attention on my clinical academic medicine, uh, not so much in, looking out the house. Of course, she will consult me if there's a major issue, but otherwise. So I think the success, always they say there's a woman behind every man's success. So that's my wife. Uh, to her, I'm most grateful. Uh, that, that's very nice, uh, Arul. Uh, finally, one final question. Um, uh, I don't think many of us can hold a candle to your achievements and to your success. But there are, there are things that you and I share, Arul. What do you think is the, 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 the most embarrassing thing that you and I share? Well, I learned that both of us contested for presidency of the Medical Students Union. And uh, we both lost. So, <laughs> but, but we have other important things to cherish about. We are both uh, doing well and... Uh, we were happy. The candidates who won over us were very good candidates. In my case, it was Dr. Devendra. I think it was Dr. Kuvera. Korea, Dr. Korea. Korea, Korea. Yeah, so did, they're yeah. all successful people. Yes. Um, so, and we took it. I mean, I lost the elections and Devi asked me to come and join the celebration party. So I went from Blob and joined him and enjoyed the party. And then I remember I, that very I, well. I remember that very well. Yeah. So... I think winning and losing is part of life and we have to accept with, uh, in a magnanimous way yeah. and wish the person who is winning the very best. And that is why team sports are important. Uh, accepting responsibilities as a winner or loser is important. So uh, Dave uh, is a good friend of mine, so I don't have anything against him. No, I, it's, uh, the, it's the same with me. Eugene Correa is a very good friend of mine. And he went on to greater things. He, he was the, the, the president of the Sri Lanka College of 
uh, general practitioners, okay. and I think they're lost to a better person. So we share that in common. Aru. <laughs> I think that's that, that's the point where we end this interview. Arul, I'm, I'm really grateful on behalf of our batch and the 1975 group for giving us of your very valuable time to come and talk to us. And thank you very much. And may I wish you on behalf of all of us the very best for the future. Thank you very much. And I wish you and your batchmates the very best. Thank you. Thank you, Arul. Thank you very much.